Okay. My name is Sandeep Vaslikar. I am president of the Strategic Foresight Group in Mumbai, in India. And we are here to discuss Blue Peace. So what is Blue Peace? We have two very distinguished uh, panelists here with me. Uh, Kabine Kumara was Prime Minister of Guinea, Conakry. Uh, and uh, later on, he was the super Prime Minister of four West Asian, uh, West African countries. He was a High Commissioner of Senegal River Basin Organization that uh, is made of Senegal, Mali, Mauritania, and Guinea. And it's a supranational organization that governs the management of river in these four countries. And on my left is Danilo Turk. Danilo Turk was president of Slovenia. He was assistant secretary general of the United Nations. And uh, last two years, he has been the chairman of global high-level panel on water and peace. So as you can see, both Danilo Turk and Kabine Kumara are not really water engineers. They are political leaders and diplomats who realized at some stage that they need to apply the wisdom and experience they acquired in their political career to address the problem of global water crisis. And we will soon ask them why. But let me give you a few facts to get the discussion going. When we are here in Kaskai, and you go out, instead of sitting here and uh, listening to the discussions once in a while, and you look at the sea, and you think that, uh, you know, there is a sea everywhere, there is the ocean everywhere. Why are people talking about water crisis at all? And then you come here and you look at the hotel next door. And this is the hotel which is known for, uh, it's associated with James Bond. <laughs> and James Bond, as you, uh, as you well know, was known as Not Not Seven. Now, what is the connection between global water situation and Not Not Seven? Now, the, of all the water that exists, that you see, 97% of the water is saline. It's in the oceans. It's, in, uh, it's not really something that you can use, except for desalination. And later on, we will have uh, Mr. Rebrav uh, to talk about desalination towards the end. But other than that, you can't really drink this water. You can't really use this water. You can only use fresh water. And even out of the remaining 3%, all of that cannot be used. So it so happens that of all the water that is there on the planet Earth, only 0.007% water is what you can use. So it's very easy to remember. You have a hotel associated with 007, and 0.007% of the total global water is what you can use. But we are not only going to talk about water. We are going to talk about blue peace, which is the relationship between water and peace. And that expresses most profoundly in the relations between countries that share rivers and share lakes. There are 286 rivers which are shared by two or more countries. And there are 146 countries where there are transboundary rivers. So, in theory, there are 146 countries with 286 river basins, which could be places for cooperation and peace, or which could be hotspots for trouble. Now, at Strategic Foresight Group, we looked at all the 286 shared river basins in the world, and what we found was that any two countries that engage in active cooperation over water do not go to war for any reason at all either over water or over military or over uh, terrorism or religion or any other reason. So there is a close relationship between water cooperation and peace. And Danilo Turk chaired a global high-level panel 
on Water and Peace precisely to look at this linkage. So, and this panel came out with a report which was submitted to the UN Secretary General just a few months ago. And this report is called uh, Matter of Survival. But the key message of the report is that water should be used as an instrument of peace. So matter of survival represents a sense of crisis, but the message of the report gives a sense of hope. So President Turk, how do you explain this contradiction? Why do you look at water as a matter of survival and at the same time as an as a, uh, instrument of peace? Well, thank you for, for your question. And perhaps I should say that the nexus is actually quite obvious. It's, it's permanent. It has been there for a long time. And obviously something that is so fundamental to human life as water has to be used as an instrument of peace. I mean, that's in the nature of, of, of things. Uh, but I would like to tell you that uh, I worked for the United Nations or with the United Nations for about 40 years altogether, and many years in the area of human rights and later as assistant to Kofi Annan in the political sector. And we have seen in our analytical work that water, which may not be the immediate cause of conflict, is often a very important contributing factor leading to conflicts, or once the armed conflicts in water-stressed areas happen, uh, water becomes an increasingly important element of the whole situation of armed conflict. I mean, that was the time of Darfur, which was obviously very much about water. We have already then discovered that the droughts that were starting in Syria are moving populations from east to west to the coastal areas, growing social tensions, and that was seen as a potential threat. It was still very potential, not an immediate or direct cause, but, but concerns were there. We have seen things happening in Yemen with the depletion of aquifers and so forth. So uh, those who were dealing with the questions of political relations and the slow accumulation of reasons which then lead to armed conflict were always concerned about water. And it was always obvious that if you do things in water cooperation in a timely manner, in an intelligent manner, in a cooperative manner, then of course you are contributing to peace. Now this is not a new realization really, because um, in Europe, for example, which is a continent that has experienced many wars over the last um, several centuries, every major war ended with a peace treaty or a peace arrangement of some kind, most of which included some kind of water clauses from Peace of Westphalia, which has had uh, water clauses, water cooperation about navigation primarily, and of course taxation for uh, you know, the commercial uh, uses of navigation. And then uh, Danube, you know, after the War of Crimea, 1856, uh, up to the Balkan Wars in 1990s, which ended with the a, with a Sava River, one of the major tributaries to Danube, Again, um, peaceful cooperation was an important part of peace arrangement. And I believe that once the war in Syria ends, there will have to be arrangements for water cooperation involving Turkey and Syria, Iraq as well. So it has to be a little more regional. And obviously, we don't know how far that will go. But the linkages, the nexus is uh, obvious to somebody who deals with this political aspect from start, and of course, then one starts thinking, all right, uh, we see the nature of the problem, we see the basic direction towards solutions, but we also know that we need innovative technologies, that we need imaginative diplomacy, we need innovations in cooperation, such as the Senegal River, which is a wonderful example, much more sophisticated than anything that exists in Europe, for example. And of course, then by learning a little bit on all these things, one becomes excited about uh, and passionate, as the fashionable <laughs> terminology suggests, passionate about the need to develop all these innovations for the purpose of better water cooperation, better water utilization, and obviously also strengthening of peace. So 
Prime Minister Kumara, President Turk says that every war, every major war that ended in Europe since 1648 until now had a water as one of the peace clauses. But in West Africa, you are more, more enlightened than the Europeans. You crafted water agreement or water peace agreement to prevent any kind of a war. So you didn't wait for the war to take place and 100 million people to die and then sign a peace agreement including water. You had the foresight, being the Africans uh, from, uh, from the western part of the continent, to, to create that water cooperation to prevent the war in the first place. So congratulations on your vision <laughs> to start with. And please explain how you did it and what's your experience with the Senegal River Basin Organization. Thank you very much, Sandeep. I must say that uh, the use of water in African culture is something that is almost embedded in our ADN. In traditional Africa, two tribes who might be neighbor and they were sharing the same river will always meet once in a while, at least once a year, to do what they call some sacrifice in order to protect the source of water, knowing that if uh, this source is in danger, all of them will disappear. And then there are some practices whereby before you became an adult, you have to exercise some kind of uh, internship in protecting water sources. So that when you become an adult, you understand that the sense of life is based on the protection of water. So this has been a rule in almost always in Africa, particularly in my country, that is a very peculiar country. Guinea is only less than 300,000 square kilometers. But believe me or not, it has 1,200 rivers. <laughs> 1,200 rivers. And for most of them, you only hear about uh, Senegal. You think it's the name of a country. But in fact, it's the name of a river born in Guinea that is flowing through Mali, Senegal, and Mauritania. We hear about Gambia. For most of them, Gambia is the name of a country. But it's the name of a river born in Guinea that is flowing to give its name to the Gambia. Niger and Nigeria are named after a river born in Guinea. All of them. So Guinea being somehow the water tank of West Africa has been playing a very leading role in promoting water cooperation, particularly because it has at least 14 transnational uh, basin. So what's happened in the case of, you have just alluded to, in the River Senegal case is that uh, that river is very specific in its nature. Unless different to any other river flowing from one country to another, the river Senegal is a border between Senegal and Mali, between Mali and Mauritania, and Senegal and Mauritania, while coming from Guinea. So it's a very peculiar river where people cross it's, it's from one side to another, leaving one country to another. So it's a kind of junction, anywhere you'll be on the river. What happened that they anticipated in the 70s, when there was civil drought in West Africa, the river Senegal that is ending in the sea, in this city called Sinlui. For history, Sinlui was the capital city of Senegal before and the capital of Mauritania. Mauritania didn't have a capital during the colonial time. So the river is ending on the sea at that area. And during this drought time, the salty water was coming inside the river to up to 300 kilometers. There was also no, no, no agriculture, no fishing, no drinking water. So all those almost 200, 2 million people were in danger. We did felt that it was very important for them to do something. They met in Guinea, the water tank of, 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 of Africa. The four leaders at that time were very young. Secretary of Guinea, 
Mokhtar Udada of Mauritania, Senghor in Senegal, and Modibo Keita in Mali. They met and they said, hey guys, we need to do something. Otherwise, we will not survive. We didn't wait for climate change issues to be, become a worldwide agenda. <laughs> we create that organization. It was called at that time OERS, Organization of Rivers Riparian of Senegal. So it has two main elements. One is saying that um, any part of a river is an intellectual property. It's common property. No country can claim to be owning one cubic meter of a river. Second principle that whatever we'll be building an infrastructure, it'll be a common property owned jointly. You'll sell it jointly, you'll look for financing jointly, you'll build it jointly, and you put it jointly, and you'll share benefits jointly. So from there, there is no disputes about who will be owing what, who will be controlling what. Those are the key principles that also prompted the creation of a significant organization called OMBS four years after in, in Mauritania. So yes, uh, OMVS is very peculiar in nature, but it's based on our tradition and culture, sharing, protecting our common wealth. Uh, thank you. Uh, but you have the Senegal River, where basically you are submitting or subjugating your national sovereignty to the Senegal River Basin Commission. And it's the commission which decides and owns all the, all the property, all the infrastructure that is, uh, that is being held. Uh, but, and the same model is now practiced by the Gambia River, the countries that share Gambia River. And you have a slightly different model in the Niger River, where the property is not owned, but there is a veto power of each country. But here in Europe, you have a very interesting example, one of the best in the entire world where two countries jointly manage and coordinate their activities on all the rivers that flow through those two countries. So these are two most enlightened countries in, in Europe and, and, and one of the two, two of the most enlightened countries in the, in the world. Because most of the cooperation, as Danilo, you said, Sava River is best on the river. Senegal River is, 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 is best on the river. Rhine River is best sure. on the river. Danube River is best on the river. But, but all the rivers in these two countries, the two governments totally coordinate. And these two most enlightened countries in Europe and in the world are Portugal and Spain. This is our host country here. And I'm happy to welcome senior officials from the Portuguese government who are responsible for managing this relationship with Spain, which is known as Albufera Convention. So in a couple of minutes, I'll come and request one of you to explain how this Albufera Commission works. But before that, a lot of the participants here are from business. And I want to ask you a business question. Maybe somebody can get a moving mic to our colleagues from Portugal, Frank. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, but I have a business question for you. Please. So through this uh, joint investments and uh, joint projects, how much money is being made? What kind of business plan is it? Uh, how much, uh, what is the budget for joint irrigation for hydroelectricity, say, just in Senegal River uh, Basin Commission? Okay. At the moment, the budget is about $4 billion. $4 billion. In terms of investment. Yeah. About uh, half a billion for navigation, because the three countries that are sharing the navigable part of the river want to connect the sea to the inland country, which is Mali, so that Mali can have an internal access to the sea. So it's going to make this river in about 900 <laughs> kilometers to be navigable from Mali to the sea, ocean or Atlantic Ocean. Then you have irrigation. There are a potential about 200,000 hectares of land to be irrigated. That will be about, about $1 billion. So $1 billion irrigation? Yes. Yeah, Okay, half a billion for navigation. Half a billion navigation? Yes. And the rest, let's say two billion for uh, hydro dam. Okay. We, are, we have about 2,000 potential megawatts of capacity that can be built and developed on the, on the river. And then we have the rest is for uh, ecology and environment. There is a need to protect the mountains that are in Guinea that are generating water for the river. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kumar. Before, before we come to the Albufera Convention, people, let me ask you, 
in this panel, global panel that you chaired, uh, while it's primarily about how to build peace and security using water, you, one of your key recommendations is to have innovative financial approach yeah. to water cooperation. And uh, Mr. Kumara's example of just Senegal River uh, shows us why. I mean, it's $4 billion is a lot. But what were the other factors that, that were in your mind in making this recommendation? Well, I think that one has to understand the political sensitivity of this cooperation. And I think that one of the key conclusions that we make is that it is necessary to involve high-level political representatives, political leaders in the processes that lead to arrangements. Now, that are, those arrangements may be different, some based on technology, others based on cooperation between the neighboring countries, and so on. And in every case, political leadership is important. Just to tell you a kind of a small anecdote, which should be in a kind of an introduction to what we hear about Albufera, when we presented uh, the report to Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations, he told us, oh yes, I remember Albufera, I was Prime Minister at the time, and we were negotiating the, uh, the, the agreement, and you know, it was, very, it was very sensitive, you know, public opinion, it was seen as something uh, almost dangerous. But once we had an agreement, it all evaporated. You know, all the political problems that were associated with the, um, uh, with the making of the agreement disappeared. So that, that's one lesson that we have learned in many places, that the sen political sensitivity of water cooperation requires high level of political uh, leadership. And of course, that political leadership is then translated into adequate arrangements. Now, on the financial side, <coughs> Uh, one could see, I mean, in the, in the case of OMVS, the Senegal River, the legal personality of OMVS allows drawing on resources which would otherwise be very difficult to use, very difficult to get to. Uh, we were, in our report, we are advocating the idea of joint investment plans between neighboring countries. If the countries def define their investment plans together, then, make, then it becomes easier to design appropriate cooperation arrangements and also uh, water infrastructure. And we also advocate such things as creating of safe space. Now, safe space in the way the financial uh, leaders or financial experts define this, um, uh, this, this concept, that is to identify the potential dangers uh, to an investment before any serious decision on an investment is taken. So in other words, there is a great deal of diplomacy needed prior to the proper technological and financial decisions on joint water infrastructure in the border area, for example. Yeah. Now, in order to get to that point, it is important to have the diplomatic process, political leadership, and so forth. Now, this doesn't sound very financial, but it is quite vital for success of financial arrangements. And that is what our panel really emphasized in our report. Well, you also mentioned Albufera, so let's go to Mr. Uh, uh, Nakosta. How does it work? No? Yes, I think it's working now. I apologize for my voice. You are the president of Portuguese Environmental Authority, right? Yes, I'm the, the, the chair of the Portuguese Environment Agency with Ambassador, Ambassador Matush, our lead diplomatic uh, 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 counterpart in uh, this 20-year-old uh, uh, international convention that uh, regulates uh, water flows. I'll get to that in a minute between Portugal and Spain. But of course, as was said, leadership matters. Context matters, and frankly, technocrats can also help, uh, bring some help in this. So I'll, I'll address these three topics very quickly. The Albufera Convention, uh, although 20 years old, negotiated and agreed upon when Mr. Guterres was Prime Minister, was at the time fortunate in that it uh, preceded in two years the European Union landmark water framework directive. So while we were negotiating, this convention, we had an eye already on what was then the forefront international, or for that matter, uh, intergovernmental legal instrument coming to, to being, 
which focused on integrated water resource management, river basin management, clearly picking up from experiences around the world, but certainly a few of them in Europe. The Albufera Convention, as I said, crucially regulates water flows. It actually quantifies water flows between these two countries. But context does matter, not only the European Union context, but also the fact that these two countries have become democracy since the mid-70s, and culturally akin indeed, and all this uh, provided for the backdrop for this cooperation. Incidentally, this cooperation, and it was mentioned earlier, didn't start in 1998. It was preceded by a panoply of other agreements regulating uh, energy, regulating not so much uh, flow, uh, uh, river flows because indeed the situation is somewhat different from the Danube or the Rhine River. But you can imagine that it, it also addresses fundamental issues with regard to Portugal and Spain relations. Three of the major rivers of Iberia, Iberia indeed are regulated by this convention. Uh, communities depend on, on these rivers for their livelihoods, both at Greater Lisbon, Madrid, uh, northern Portugal, uh, uh, north uh, western Spain, and also the southern uh, basin of the Guadiana River. The water flow regulation was uh, uh, instituted from the outset. It had a, 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 a host of other provisions on water quality, drought management, flood management. In this sense, it is similar to what you've seen uh, um, in other agreements, but of course, more detailed. What we did was we were able to negotiate two, we call densification of the regime, in two strokes, further putting water flows from not only annual to monthly to weekly. Oh. And this is, I think, the unprecedented. This is, I think, what, what you don't see in other agreements uh, around the world. Uh, in that, but crucially also, uh, again, uh, an idiosyncrasy. We do not have a river commission in the sense of a permanent secretariat commission. It was found not needed, but we do have a commission that uh, uh, assesses all the issues on a regular basis, meets annually. There's a conference of parties also to, uh, uh, at a political level, at a high level, to uh, allow for this to be identified. This year, uh, and I'll finish, uh, we're undergoing yet another round of negotiations uh, in terms of uh, uh, densifying more river uh, flow in the southern part of, uh, of the Guadiana River, in the Algarve. Um, and we will also be looking at uh, issues pertaining to, this is an, obviously another uh, uh, challenge, pertaining to the challenge of uh, climate change. And really trying to think through, uh, um, in the years ahead, how do we manage a scarce resource in a context where uh, uh, certain uses indeed uh, over the years have put pressure on, on the resource. Context, leadership, and frankly, you know, uh, outright technical provisions that allow indeed for this to work. Thanks very much. Do you have any joint investment plans for jointly by Spain and Portugal on projects uh, to use the, to harness the benefits of the river? Yes, but not at the level or scale that we heard yesterday. We, we haven't had a tradition in this sense, uh, except uh, in specific cases to put forward billions of euros to build a dam that can be shared by both countries. There have been dams built that were the result of understanding between the countries, but not as a uh, uh, yeah. earmarked money for that. What we do have in each country, of course, is uh, water uh, uh, river basin management plans, which foresee uh, a very big investment on both sides. In Portugal alone, for instance, it's in the vicinity of 1 billion euros up to 2027, and these are coordinated. This is also very important that, pursuant to European Union law, uh, water basin management plans have increasingly been coordinated with a view to becoming joint management plans over time. Thank you. Thank you for your... Yes, Ambassador. You, I would like just to add some, um, a few words. As president of the commission that regulates the, um, the relationship <coughs> between Portugal and Spain concerning the, our main rivers, um, I would just um, stress the importance of the political uh, leadership. Um, this is one, one of our uh, one, one of the main uh, issues that we 
we, of course, uh, um, discuss in our regular meetings with the uh, uh, Spanish authorities. Um, and uh, it's also one of the uh, main items of the summit. We have an yearly summit with, uh, with Spain. And of course, this is one of the, of the areas that we revisit uh, very regularly um, uh, with our Spanish friends. So I would say that um, the relationship with Spain um, is uh, completed by uh, this uh, specific area where many interests are involved uh, in both sides of uh, our border. Um, and that has been, um, as I said, a main topic for um, our uh, friendly relationship. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so moving on from cooperation and the dividends that cooperation can uh, accrue, uh, you have been advocate, I've been also subscribing to this view that uh, Water should be taken up uh, by the UN Security Council. And now, in fact, it has become a reality yeah. that uh, mm -hmm. in November 2016, UN Security Council took up water formally as a security issue. Uh, and you have made in the panel a number of recommendations to protect water resources from a peace and security point of view for, uh, from terrorist attacks, violent conflicts, uh, et cetera. And you have expressed future worries in uh, not in Senegal Basin, but other parts of West Africa. So why do you think water uh, is very important in the global security agenda, not just on the cooperation agenda? Well, one has to understand that armed conflicts are part of our reality. And in armed conflicts, increasingly, we see water being uh, either used as a weapon or water installations, water infrastructure, and resourcing being attacked as an object of attack. So that's a problem. And of course, that problem is not new. It was there before. Uh, the international legal instruments that uh, constitute international humanitarian law today have recognized that there, was, there are some fundamental norms that exist from before. What has been lacking and what is still lacking is uh, more determined policy by those bodies uh, which, are, you know, which have uh, prerogatives, which, which have powers to do something about these things. I mean, of course, Security Council, whatever criticism we may level against the Security Council, we cannot ignore uh, its importance and its uh, formidable powers. So it was quite natural for the panel on water and peace to look into the armed conflicts in addition to what we have said already about water as an instrument of peace and see how better protect um, water installations and water resources in armed conflicts. Uh, so we have made a number of recommendations, including water ceasefires. We have advocated the need for the Security Council when dealing with specific geographically defined security situations and armed conflicts to pay attention to water issues and guide its uh, policies with the aim to protect those resources and installations. Some of that has happened already, not very effective, I must say, but that's a beginning which, which will expand. I'd like to say that in March this year, uh, the Security Council specifically looked at the water situation of the Lake Chad, where the entire region is now inflamed with either armed conflicts, low intensity conflicts and tensions, and the question of water is uh, essential for the future. So in terms of um, dealing with water issues in armed conflicts, there is a growing recognition that more has to be done for protection of resources and installations. But of course, the security aspect does not end there. I mean, I would like to mention our experience from the Senegal River, which our panel visited, and we went to San Louis, which is uh, a, a downstream uh, the river close to the sea, uh, and uh, on the border between Senegal and Mauritania. And we visited the place at the time when there was a growing concern in West Africa because of uh, then recent uh, terrorist attacks uh, in, the, in the region. And I asked the security chief of that uh, installation, how does he see the security situation affecting uh, that, uh, that infrastructure on the, as I said, downstream the Senegal River? He said, well, 
our system is based on support of the local population. Local people understand full well that uh, if something happens to our dam, uh, there will be salination very far upstream. And that would be detrimental, possibly fatal for the agriculture and, of course, livelihood for, of practically everybody in the area. So we rely on cooperation and, and support of local population, which will tell us immediately if something strange is starting to happen. We don't have any indigenous terrorism in our region, but of course, if people come from elsewhere, they will be noticed and we shall know about that sufficiently early. Well, that's one small example of the security aspect which is always there and which is important. Uh, and there are, there are many others, but that's for another discussion. Uh, yeah, but that's, uh, that's because the local people there are cooperative and they are, <clears throat> they are aware. But you go to other parts of the world, U United States uh, Department of Homeland Security issued a report a few years ago and they listed 25 attacks on water infrastructure from 2001 to 2010 in the first 10 years. And then Strategic Foresight Group issued a report only on the Middle East, and there have been 25 attacks on water infrastructure only in the Middle East from 2011 to 2016. So 25 worldwide in the first decade, 25 the, just in the region of uh, the Middle East in the second decade, I mean, not even second decade, the half decade, so at least 50 attacks, uh, terrorist attacks. I see uh, the former minister from uh, Afghanistan there, and uh, they are having a problem. The Selma Dam between, uh, on the Harirud River in Afghanistan has been attacked by terrorists several times uh, while it was being constructed, and I think even after it is being constructed. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a big risk uh, to the dam and uh, to the people there. It's a, it's a big issue uh, in that region with the dam being uh, attacked. I see Julia Hortzman here who's concerned about terrorism. And uh, if you are thinking about ISIS, uh, the biggest strength of ISIS was that it controlled dams and other water infrastructure in the Middle East for the last three years. And in May of last year, uh, the, the last of the dams that ISIS controlled, I mean, they initially controlled seven, eight dams, and then slowly the Iraqi security forces took over, liberated those dams, but one of them, Tapka Dam, which is the biggest dam in Syria, was, was being controlled by ISIS. And last May, uh, this was uh, freed from the ISIS. Uh, of course, it was taken over by another armed group. That's a different story. But it was freed by the, from the ISIS. And within, within three months, ISIS lost 90% of his territory and resources. So it shows how crucial water is to the strategies of the terrorists. So we have, before I request Mr. Ishad Ribrab to go to a little more optimistic part uh, from, uh, uh, from the threats to water security to some of the technological solutions, we have a little bit of time for a couple of uh, questions or comments from the, from the floor for Mr. Turk or Mr. Kumara. Yes, please, uh, always give preference to the, to the backbenchers. <laughs> you are from Kazakhstan. Yes, I'm from, I'm from Kazakhstan, and uh, we had a problem. I'm sure many of you are aware, the RLC. It was one of the biggest man-made catastrophes of the last century. Uh, luckily, with you know, help with, from international organizations, the Kazakh part of the Caspian Sea is being restored slowly. However, I was wondering if uh, you know, it would be possible to ask for international organizations to help unite Central Asian countries to deal with the water scarcity problem that is growing uh, because it seems that we on our own are not inclined to hear each other when it comes to water. When uh, we have big business partners that have, if you can put the water agenda as part of aid packages or as part of uh, developmental programs uh, to force us to listen to each other, that would have been great. And the second point is, uh, Kazakhstan, one of our biggest water uh, rivers, starts in China. And uh, this issue is rising and is going to be growing as you know, consumption grows in Xinjiang. Uh, if the EU uh, or the Western organizations or global organizations can act as catalysts for helping our voices being heard in our dialogue with China, because we on our own will not, you know, loud enough to be heard. We will, uh, we will take a couple of more comments before we come to you, so that way we have more uh, participants. Anybody else uh, uh, from, uh, from there before? Yes, please. Uh, good afternoon. 
And thank you. Uh, could you address the issue of the conflict, the brewing conflict between Egypt and Ethiopia over the, the dam and the issue of the water distribution between the three countries, Ethiopia and Sudan and Egypt? Thank you. Yeah, one more and then we come back here. Anyone? No, okay, we'll come back in the next round. Uh, uh, Kabine, you want to start with uh, yeah. either Egypt, Ethiopia, why don't you yeah. start? Easy one. Okay. Easy one for you. Uh, and I will say something some with the Central Asia. Uh, difficult yeah. one for you, easy one for him, <laughs> the Kazakhstan. <laughs> no, it is obvious that uh, in Africa, the River Nile, Case is one of the most problematic one, when, uh, particularly when Ethiopia decided to build that uh, grand uh, dam renaissance. One should remember that uh, Ethiopia is uh, owning the Blue Nile uh, uh, that is giving almost 70 to 85 percent of the water to the Nile. And yet, Ethiopia is 130 million population. Only three or four percent have access to potable water, and uh, not more than five percent have access to electricity. While uh, it was the British who, in 1929, had put in place a formula sharing the bulk of water between Egypt and Sudan. So, of course, that arrangement could not stand when both countries became independent, both are in upstream side. And particularly when Ethiopia, who got a very nationalistic government about uh, 15 years back, and the Ethiopian decided to take advantage of resources. And uh, it was difficult uh, rationally to, to prevent them from doing something. But the issue was, how they could have cooperated with Egypt and Sudan to agree on something. An initiative was launched among the 18th and 10th country sharing the river Nile to agree on a formula. But one particular clause did not get the approval of Egypt. And they have been negotiating on and on and on for more than 15 years. The rest of the countries did set up separate arrangement. And uh, what I can say that uh, since Ethiopia is moving ahead, uh, Egypt did a lot of lobbying so that the international government would not finance the dam in Ethiopia, but the Ethiopian were clever enough to, to organize the kind of contribution from everybody. The dam is going to be ready almost at the end of this year. There have been some negotiation and I'm pleased to know that uh, about a few, few months back, the president of Egypt met in Uganda, better countries, so that they can see how to agree on a formula to put in place a proper Bayesian organization that will share, that could put in place the principle for managing the river Nile. It's not easy, but there is no other solution but to cooperate. Thank you. See, the main point is, in Nile Basin, they left it to the water ministers to negotiate. That's why they couldn't find a solution. Yes. In Senegal Basin, they are the heads of government. In Albu Pera, it was the prime ministers. That's why they could find solutions. And as Kumara is saying, that now that the presidents are starting to intervene, there is some hope that there could be a solution. Yes. But about Central Asia, Danilo? I think the basic principle is the same. <laughs> because Central Asia, of course, knows these complications ever since independence of the five Central Asian countries. And for the most part of this period of 25 years or so, uh, the problem was essentially political and largely because of, <coughs> let's be very frank and very, very direct, um, the leadership of Uzbekistan, which was not prepared to participate in most of the regional initiatives and had its problems with the neighboring Tajikistan uh, which were really uh, managed in a way which, which could not lead to any sort of solution. So there was a political problem, and that political problem was at the level of the head of state. Now, uh, there is a change now. There's a new head of state in Uzbekistan. 
there is a new wind of cooperation among the, all of the five uh, countries of Central Asia. And issues such as RLC uh, show signs of you know, better, uh, how should I say, political climate in which uh, joint uh, arrangements could be, could be developed. And of course, this is, RLC is only one. It's a very big problem, but only one among problems. It's also the question of deteriorating infrastructure everywhere, the need to have better bilateral arrangements between neighboring countries, such as Tajikistan and Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, for example. And there has been progress. Now, the reason for hope that I have is the following. There are many actors involved in Central Asia with good intentions and good capacities. UN is there, European Union is there, Switzerland has a very important project on blue peace, which has actually helped Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan to develop a better understanding on water quantities, um, issuing regular bulletins on the, on the rivers that flow between the two countries. So, you know, there has been some progress with important participation of international actors, and I believe that now with the new political wind, we can perhaps convince the five presidents to really start working together for a joint, or should I say, strategy. I would only like to add one seemingly technical thing. You know, in our report, we speak about Blue Fund uh, as a kind of an in, in, financial instrument which could help by uh, putting emphasis at an early stage on uh, taking care of the ancillary costs of infrastructural investment, uh, like uh, interest rates, insurance, and others. So if we could do something in terms of financial improvement that would stimulate regional cooperation, that would help. This would not resolve the problem with China, of course, but China has its own vision of of one belt, one road, belt and road uh, initiative. So this should be clearly made part of belt and road initiative as well, and Russia. Now, you see, I have in a very telegraphic manner listed the whole spectrum of things that need to be done. What I want to emphasize is all this is doable now because political conditions in Central Asia now are better compared to what they were two years ago. So we have a movement of hope in Central Asia, and let's go to another aspect of hope that's delivered by technology. And we have uh, Mr. Ishad Rebrav, uh, a leading industrialist from uh, Algeria, chairman of the Sevital Group. But before you, uh, you, you share some views, I think we are going to see a video, right? Uh, yeah. Water is the most substantial resource on planet Earth and the basis for life. 97% of the water on Earth is seawater, and most of the fresh water is bound in Antarctic ice or deep reservoirs. As humans, we need sweet water for drinking and agriculture. By 2030, 40% of the population will not have access to clean drinking water. Salinities are increasing due to rejected desalination concentrates. Present coastal freshwater reservoirs are flooded by intrusion of seawater. Fresh water is getting scarce in many regions and per person's water availability decreases significantly. This is caused by climate change and immense growth of population. All this brings along a rising demand to use high saline sources for desalination. The world needs a solution. Let's introduce the Evcon technology from Sevital Group. Evcon technology is based on evaporation and condensation, simulating the natural freshwater cycle. Beyond that, a hydrophobic membrane secures only the purest steam to pass, ensuring premium water quality. Our membrane distillation is capable of overcoming given restrictions of other processes. Evcon technology treats water with higher salinity. Evcon membrane distillation system produces very pure water. It needs less energy uses free low temperature waste heat which reduces the operation costs. Our new technology produces ultra pure water and water for injection which has been tested by global leaders in pharma, chemical industry and power production with zero germs and zero bacteria. This enables drinking water production from almost any source but also the direct production of water for injection is only one step where others need four. So use the very pure water provided from our solution for your food and beverage industry, pharma or chemical industry, or to deliver drinking water to regions with water scarcity.
Evcon, new technology for ultra pure water production. Mr. Rebrav, can you please come and explain a little bit what we just saw? And since you are going to speak French, your colleague Kamal is going to help us with uh, simultaneous translation. Good mass of ceremony. Hmm? You, you manage this thing very well. Eh? Honorable assistance, vous venez de voir à travers cette présentation notre nouvelle technologie FCON du groupe Cevital. Une technologie au service de l'humanité et qui va révolutionner la problématique de l'eau au niveau mondial par la qualité, la quantité et par le coût. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to introduce you to FCON Technology, the new technology from Cevital Group, a technology at the service of humanity which will address the problem of water globally by quality, quantity, cost, which will, dis which will disrupt the world. La qualité <coughs> pour l'industrie pharmaceutique, une eau ultra pure d'injection d'une qualité supérieure à dix fois ce qui est produit jusqu'à maintenant. Pourquoi C'est la seule technologie capable aujourd'hui de filtrer la vapeur avant sa destillation, avant sa, sa, euh, avant sa, sa condensation. Quality for the pharma industry. Ultra pure water for injection with a quality 10 times better than the, what has been produced so far. Why? It is the only technology capable of filtering vapor for hydrophobic membranes before condensation. Pour l'industrie agroalimentaire, fini les maladies causées par la mauvaise qualité de l'eau. Notre eau est une eau premium, ultra pure, sans germes, sans impureté et sans bactéries, enrichie en minéraux et oligo-éléments au bénéfice de la santé de l'humanité. For the food industry, no more disease caused because of poor quality of water. Our water is ultra pure premium water without germs, impurity, or bacteria. Ultra pure water enriched with minerals and oligo element for the benefit of human health. Pour la quantité, on peut avoir des stations d'une capacité de 24 mètres cubes par jour, comme on peut avoir aussi des stations supérieure à un million de mètres cubes d'eau par jour. Quantity. Our technology is modular. We can build seawater desalination plants from 24 cubic meter a day up to more than 1 million cubic meter a day. Pour le coup, notre technologie a le plus bas coût opérationnel par rapport aux technologies <coughs> utilisées jusqu'à maintenant. Osmose inverse, c'est 3,5 kWh par mètre cube par jour, alors que notre technologie, c'est seulement 1,5 kWh par mètre cube et par jour. Now the cost. Our technology has the lowest operational cost compared to other technologies used to date. 
As an example, reversal osmosis operational cost is 3.5 kilowatt hour per cubic meter day. Our technology is 1.5 kilowatt hour per cubic meter day, more than 50% cheaper than reversal osmosis. À cela, il faut rajouter que notre technologie peut utiliser l'énergie fatale qui peut être récupérée des centrales électriques, mais aussi elle peut utiliser l'énergie solaire. Beyond this, our technology can use free energy from wasted energy recovered from power plants, but also from solar energy. Et les deux énergies sont gratuites. Merci pour votre aimable attention. Je suis à votre entière disposition si vous avez des questions à poser. Et merci. And the two energies are free. And I would like to thank you all for your kind attention. And I will, uh, please feel free to ask me any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rebrov. We started six minutes after five. We are concluding six minutes after six. <laughs> Mr. Rebrov is going to be here. If any of you have any questions on this technology or any of these issues, I'm sure you'll be able to meet the people here. Uh, please, I request him to wait here for some time so people can interact with him. Uh, but what the message we got from him and from Danilo Turk and from Kabine Komara, I'll just conclude in one sentence, is that, that water can be crisis, but water also has solutions. These solutions come from politics, they come from institutional arrangements, they come from innovative technologies. And if you deploy all of them, water can turn into a big instrument of peace, the blue peace. Thank you, thank you ladies and gentlemen, for being here. Thank you, President Talk. Thank you, Prime Minister Komara. Thank you. And thank you, our colleagues from Portugal. And thank you, Mr. Uh, Abraham.